Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in for the third conversation in the series. I'm Kate from BEAM, uh, we're a founding member of the National Arts and Place Consortium. I'd like to give a big thank you to all the members involved in helping to curate this series, um, to the Art Fund for their support and also to our artists and speakers as well. So each talk has been streamed live, um, so if you've got any comments or questions, please use the live chat um, function and we'll try and pick some of these up towards the end of the conversation. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter using hashtag Arts and Place now to carry on chatting afterwards. So now I'm really pleased to hand over to Mark Titchener and Sherry Dobbin. So I'll get them up on the screen with us. Hi, Mark. Hi, Hi Sherry. Hi, Kate. Right. Thank you so much. I'll hand over to you then, okay? Great. Thank you. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, really quickly, I'm Sherry Dobbin. I'm a partner at Future City. We're a global placemaking and art commissioning agency. And so my work and my brain works across permanent installations, temporary, programmatic, and even thinking about cultural infrastructure. Um, Mark Titchener has a history with Future City. Um, along with my colleagues, Andy Robinson and Vicki Young. He's created permanent pieces in Cambridge and at London Bridge Station. He also did a project in Deptford called Deptford X. And um, I was fortunate enough, even though I, I didn't get to help actually make it, but to open and welcome Mark's piece at London Bridge. And it was great because it also tied to a strategy that we had created with uh, Team London Bridge in thinking about the whole area. And one of the things that really struck me about Mark and his work and something that we were able to use in the, the opening remarks is, you know, what does an 18th century French nobleman, an American post hardcore band and a self-help recovery book have in common? And it's all Mark Titchener. It's all about the work that he uses um, with his text. And then on another level, personally, I've got a very eclectic, working past curating and producing. And one of the programs that I worked on was called Midnight Moment in Times Square. And this was all about bringing art to the electronic billboards of, um, of Times Square and handing over that platform to the artists. And because of that, I have an obsession now with the knowledge of billboards, how people use them, how they can access them, when artists go on them, what those messages mean. And so we wanted to be able to bring Mark Titchener into conversation about his latest work, Please Believe These Days Will Pass, that you may have noticed. And also to use this as an opportunity to really open up about how doing work in the public realm comes about. What are the kinds of different questions that happen if it's temporary or if it's permanent? How does it change the players? What's the sort of structure behind that? And Mark is also uh, based in South London. Born in Luton, correct? That's right. Um, went to Central St. Martins. And then in addition to his work in the public realm, I mean, he's collected by the Arts Council, the British Council, South London Gallery, the Government Art Collection, Tate Gallery, nominated for Turner Prize, been part of the Venice Biennial, been part of Art Now series at Tate Britain. So Marx really, really does work across any genre and any venue that makes sense for the work and has been showcased in many ways. So it's great to have that breadth of practice. And I think, Mark, what we want to do is just find out this, this work that you did that was a, a part of the Your Space or Mine project that came about right at the point of, right at our sort of lockdown with COVID-19. Can you talk to us a little bit about this piece, what the origins are of it, and, and how it came uh, to this opportunity? Sure. Um, thanks for the introduction, Jerry. Um, I'll tell you what, just in case, because I guess people won't have seen this page that we're talking about. So I'm going to just, I'll, I'll share an image of one of the kind of iterations of this work while I say a little bit about it. Great. Um, so, and people may not have known what exactly they were looking at because these were printed billboards as well as digital billboards that were popping up not just all over London but several other cities as well. Yes, yeah, so they were in uh, ten cities around around the UK, um, and yeah, they were occupying billboard sites, poster sites. Um, I'll show you some examples in a moment. Um, yeah, and some digital um, digital screens as well. And I guess depending on 
they were they yeah they're very much part of the sort of urban infrastructure of, the, of those cities so very different in every place um the projects yeah i mean the, 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 i guess a bulk of the projects took place in in london and um it happened very early in lockdown so it was the first the, the opportunity for this to happen basically it happened with it during the first week of lockdown so i suppose the point of the most strong feeling of disconnection from place that you can possibly imagine you know when we're all desperately trying to recalibrate the public realm and um and, and, and very far away from it as well the first um time I saw the work actually because it's you have to remember that you know we, we were all this was kind of done remotely um was a friend of mine in Berlin sending me, me an image of this digital screen from a Russian news network so so in I, order to you know, be your local you you had to you had to go global yeah I guess I guess I mean you know a lot of the works were up in um, East London I'm based in South London so again I didn't actually see any of these works physically for quite a few weeks um, so the work you know this piece and my experience of it was very much mediated by the way that people were using social media and so I tell, tell you a little bit about the background to the project yeah I think you know how did this come about who contacted whom where did the idea come from Yes, I mean, I really have to say, I mean, the project itself as you know, the possibility of the project was the result of um, an invitation from Jack Arts, which is a part of an organisation called Build Hollywood. And they contacted me. Um, I was actually due to speak at a conference about public art that they were running, which was cancelled during, during lockdown. So we did have a kind of relationship, but I'd never worked with them. And they were, I guess, very quickly trying to think about what they could do with these advertising sites that they had around the UK. Um, you know, which is, is quite impressive, actually, that, that almost immediately they had this sort of sense of, you know, this is an opportunity to do something un, un, unusual with these rather than kind of letting the kind of, you know, tired advertising that was already up there. Um, you know, stay up for another three months and look even more more tired. Um, but yes, I mean, it happened very, very quickly. I think we spoke on a maybe a Wednesday or a Thursday and the project went to print on the Monday. Uh, I mean, it was one of the, one of the things that ha had happened already was when, as we went into lockdown and as um, the, the, the kind of seriousness of what was happening was beginning to sort of unravel before us um people had started posting images of the earlier versions of this, this work um and i'll just say a little bit more about that um yeah. on on social media so i kind I, I had a sense that there was an interest in this particular kind of text and um that it was resonating with people so when this opportunity came up it it, it was almost you know, it just seemed inevitable. The thing to do was to think about this text again, which was already resonating with people. Um, so, in a way, you know, it felt more like a kind of collaborative decision, make you know, made rather than um, you know something quite outside of me, which seemed um, appropriate actually at that point in time. It was more of a community kind of choice than one that I might make on my own. So, the order of events is that you started to notice that people were were posting images of of the previous iteration of the work which we'll we'll talk about in a second then you were contacted from jack arts who had already been in contact with you because you're going to do a talk and then mm -hmm. that was the moment then did you suggest to them or did they suggest to you to use the specific text no i was, it, i mean i felt quite strongly i mean i did this offer because i think you know it's it's a good thing when having, having a conversation about artwork to to kind of um I, I i offered three kind of options but kind of strongly suggested that i thought this was the, the best one um and i think they agreed i mean it was fairly clear that um it had tapped into something quite already at that point um so tell me where the first iteration of this work when it came okay. about and what the so, text meant originally in in that context 
Yeah, so um, in 2012, I did a residency at the Art Gallery of Ontario in Toronto and worked on quite a, a lot a lot of different projects over a period of three months there, including some public works, two gallery shows, some um, work um, with high school kids, workshop-based projects there. And one, one of the elements was this exhibition I had, um, which was actually a kind of video installation and it was called Please Believe These Days Will Pass. This is the um, outside of the, the, the kind of the building and uh, the kind of, yeah, the kind of public facing title of the work, which was this kind of mirrored vinyl piece. Hmm. And I think at that point in time in 2012, I mean, it was really a, me thinking about my personal kind of situation and how, you know, it was, it was a kind of note to self, really. It was a, in terms of the social setting in Toronto, it was during the days of um, Rob Ford, who I guess people will remember as this incredibly eccentric mayor who would, you know, almost on a daily basis would be get get caught doing something terrible. Um, so there was doesn't a kind sound, of a doesn't sound like any American politician or or UK politician. <laughs> no, he was pretty pretty extreme. I mean, without going, you know, he passed away a few years ago. So I think, um, but you know, anyone in Tor I, I I just felt like anyone in Toronto would kind of know what, there was a reference to that as well because it was a daily occurrence that you know he'd be on the front page. So that was it, really. I mean, at the beginning, it was very much a kind of personal thing. I mean. It was also about, you know, my, my work is text-based and I'm interested in how simple units of language or words can be put together to kind of generate, I guess, it's not yeah, ambiguous messages or messages that can have multiple readings. So I, for me, I was really interested in this kind of tension between asking someone, you know, please and believe that, that kind of that conjunction of those two words together I, I liked the fact they seemed to kind of slightly um, contradict each other. And it, I think that that's interesting because I think in the recent work that that actually kind of, that, that disappears almost. Like it kind of becomes much, it makes more sense than it did in, in this one, which is more of a kind of me trying to convince myself to believe, you know. And then so, it, it came back again then this text yeah so i'm in a different place so the next uh, version of it was in uh 2016 so this was around the well immediately in, in the kind of aftermath of the brexit referendum and i was invited by flying leaps which is a kind of poster project um to produce a kind of yeah a work for their project and yeah, it was very clear to me at that point what these, you know, we were, myself, my friends, my colleagues were all kind of trying to navigate what was happening at that point in time. And again, the inference of what it was about was was very strong. And um, one of the iterations of this poster was a kind of free fold-out poster with the European newspaper, which you can probably see that said, a free poster to cheer you all up. Um, so yeah and again that the frame for it then the pol political events of, of um, the time so it's meaning I mean I guess what we're seeing here is that you know text when applied to certain situations you know we it obviously takes on what's the most current thing in a you know a society's kind of mind or individual's you know mind at that point and then with each of these iterations, though, there's a, there's a difference in the visual. So the text remains the same, but there mm -hmm. is there a reconsideration of what the visual is and the coloring and the approach that you take with it? Yeah, I mean, I think with this, I mean, with that version, you probably can't see it so well. I mean, I was quite, I mean, quite a lot of my works. There's this kind of idea of the background and the foreground kind of interfere, like being like an interference with each other. And actually, mm -hmm. a lot of there's quite a lot buried in there. I took um, some, I did quite a lot of drawing actually from based on sort of Islamic geometry, which was kind mm -hmm. of you know it's sort of layered up in the background. So there's a sort of echo, you know, it's kind of pointed kind of echo about um, 
what was happening in this country in terms of you know a lot of the the rhetoric around um you know why the referendum was taking place and the idea of kind of closing down and becoming this kind of sealing the borders as it were of the you know our kind of um you know physically and kind of mentally i think if i switch over to so with the with the yeah. new work it was well it was a couple of things really i mean obviously the nature of these sites is very urban um so we're often you know looking at kind of gray concrete spaces utilitarian you know utilitarian spaces and also at this point in time everything's closed and mm. bars up so it's just kind of you know really unwelcoming space you know potentially so i really you know the idea for me was to make something that kind of jarred with that kind of grayness but also was very kind of I guess almost evangelical or rapturous in its kind of color so my kind of frame of reference was thinking about you know almost lying on the beach with your eyes closed and the light kind of coming through your eyelids and you get you know those extremely bright kind of flickering mm -hmm. colors so you know actually sort of something quite transportative um yeah I mean, weirdly, the thing that I was probably thinking out in terms of art historical references was those kind of like very abstract kind of Turner seascapes, and that kind of you know, it's 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 an emotional space rather than a um, a physical one. The, the way that I think about the backgrounds, really, I mean, and the whole thing is you know, the overall impression that I want to give with these text-based poster works is to do with the kind of purveying a certain portraying a certain kind of uh, tone of voice so you know sometimes it can be a kind of i guess sort of authoritarian type voice and other times it can be a bit more of a friendly voice and or it can play around with the idea of you know something which is passing you know information along to you so i was thinking you know we, we we moved from you know this sort of tautologies of Brexit, Brexit, you know, and all this kind of let get Brexit, get Brexit done to stay home, you know, all of these kind of very instructive kind of bits of units of language. And I, um, one of the, th I think the reasons this text resonated for me was that it was, its source was ambiguous. Like it wasn't clear um, whether it was a kind of instructional, like it has a bit of an authoritarian tone to it, but actually it's sort of poetic in its kind of um you know what what it's what it's suggesting which is you know to do with hope to do with um you know to do with interior life i suppose and that's yeah, one and of the and almost more of a personal voice also more like it, it feels like someone is reaching out to actually give a sense of comfort or something as opposed to just um an objective sort of third party command, which is a little bit of what we have going on right now as well with the change of stay home, save lives or stay alert or whichever, whichever sort of mm. command it is right now. This allows a little more space to think in a different way as opposed to just out of fear or just out of um, the need to just fall into sync and, um, and obey, I suppose. Yeah, and I think that it was it was also about thinking about what it was like to be in those spaces at that time and mm -hmm. actually how leaving the house suddenly became very alien and mm -hmm. you know going to the supermarket you felt you know everyone was feeling very nervous very at risk if someone came near to you um you know and i guess we've got used to that in a way i know things that you know the social distancing is kind of lessening but we have got used to how you know staying out of the way of each other and that was something quite scary and i think those those particularly i can only sort of speak for london but i imagine the experience you know for people in lots of cities was that actually felt very lonely in those spaces it felt very isolated and um you know there was a kind of degree of fear we we're going into those spaces about what the consequences of you know, going to get your shopping were. Yeah, and as you say, the interaction or coming into contact with another um, almost could be perceived, as, you know, the first instinct was fearful as opposed to comforting in some way. Mm. So to be able to have that kind of voice in that space. 
I mean, it's also yeah. going an advertising platform. So mm. it's going in a series of advertising frames. And, um, and at a time, actually, when um, the ability to consume has actually been challenged. So it's a, it's a very odd sort of dynamic. But how, how does that change? How does that change for you in the work? Knowing that the difference between having a text-based piece that's going in a gallery where people are knowing that they're looking at an artwork to going into not just a public space, but in a frame where their first expectation when they see something on a billboard is that it's trying to sell them something. Hmm. How, how yeah. do you look at text in that regard? And also does it impact on uh, which, which kind of references you pull from in order to, to assemble the text? Yeah, I mean, I think that the um, you know the influence of advertising is incredibly um, important. I'm just going to pull up an example. I mean, I grew up in that kind of absolute kind of heyday of um, high budget kind of advertising campaign, advertising campaigns, and um, thinking about you know, here's an example here, um, like. The, you know, I guess the kind of very strong feeling that these things had a, an effect on people and they created a kind of tone for space. Um, I mean, it, it, this example, I guess it's, it's, it's very kind of direct, but one of the, you know, um, to give another example from slightly later, this would be, I guess, mid eighties, um, these kind of, you know, how bizarre kind of abstract images as well that were, you know, that played, so very sophisticated as well. Um, and I think that that kind of specter of, you know, the kind of effect of advertising really um, influenced what I do. And also that, you know, thinking about this, as I say, this kind of tone of voice, even maybe when the tone of voice is not present. I mean, obviously with these, you've got all this kind of, threat of um, what's going to happen to you if you uh, actually um, buy that product, which, you know, there's a really interesting kind of ten tension there as well. One of the things that I think I learned from looking at advertising very early on was the idea of impact and mm -hmm. that um, you have to consider the amount of time that you have to, in you know, someone might have to engage with an artwork. So the Sense that you have a few seconds, you know, that it's actually down, um, it's a very direct medium in a way um, that maybe, you know, yes, going presenting text in a gallery is because people are moving by, they're kind of doing the things that they would do in the day. They might be on public transport, they might be doing a journey that they do every day. So they're passing the thing every day and their framework for the meaning of a text changes depending on what's happening with their life um, and also that it's a social experience that other people are seeing same text and maybe um, having a completely different reading of it so that idea of I think experiencing artwork in a social setting is, is really important to me I mean I have I think folk you know I've really focused on working in sort of public realm probably for the last seven or eight years now and I, I, you know, not I have got nothing against um, working in gallery spaces, but I, when I have done exhibitions in those spaces, I've, you know, it's almost like I have to find the, the reason for doing that. It doesn't make so much sense sense to me. So, it, you know, when those opportunities have come up, it's tended to include public projects, or it's um, tended to include works where there's some sort of collaboration, or you know, interactive artworks, or so again, thinking about, you know, actually maybe the gallery or the museum is as much as a social space as what we call the public realm. I mean, I guess the difference, yeah. the, the difference is when you're working when you're working outside of a gallery also is that um, there's a little bit of a contrast, right? So there there is a little bit of that surprise of seeing something like that in that space, which is a bit of an interruption. Right to what one expects, and in that interruption, you know that can that can form either the engagement, the collaboration, the contradiction. Um, it just becomes a little bit more of a dynamic engagement uh, because 
like as you say, one may not expect to see something, one may not be um, anticipating to have that kind of experience. So the first thing it does is actually create a bit of a, a tension that opens up the possibility um, for, for creating something new as opposed to selling, selling it on. I mean, the thing that's interesting about putting up work in the advertising um, frame also is that you've got the, you've got the slogan in a sense, but you don't have the product. Have you ever have you ever been um, listened to people's comments or anything, or or witnessed any of it when people are trying to understand if they're actually looking at either an ad or a campaign or an artwork? Um, yeah, I mean that's an interesting one. I mean this it's um, this project's been interesting because with the exception of um, one person, it's been really overwhelming um, in terms of it's been very positive. Mm -hmm. normally and, and also because it's played out so much on social media I'm kind of much more aware of what people are saying about it because they tell me um, but in the past I've made poster projects you know almost in sort of analog days before the internet when I've you know you don't really have any idea who's seeing them or um, you know what their reaction is so this has been I guess a bit of a case study of um, you know, understanding how this work exists in a sort of social and um, digital social kind of setting. Um, you know, and there's as various aspects of that to do with things like, you know, the way the image is consumed by media channels or attached to other things. Um, who, have you yes, seen, it has, who have you seen um, trying to appropriate or own it? Who's, who's been using it um, for purposes to send out a message? And do they ever credit you? Well, I mean, that's that's kind of in. I've I've learned quite a lot about this. Um, I'm just gonna bring up an image. I mean, it. There was a period of time where I think if you could find an image, if if you could, if, as a photographer, if you caught someone walking past uh, these billboards with a mask on, it was a you know, kind of absolute gift. So. Right. There was a period where it's like, you know, kind of most days there would be a kind of story about coronavirus with this image, um, which was interesting. Um, and obviously as a way, we I think actually most examples I have here from The, the Guardian, um, I don't know why. <laughs> but actually, you can probably see it. I don't know if you can see it at the bottom there. You would... The, the, uh, and this actually was probably quite late on. So this particular photo is from the 12th of May, and it's still credited as street art in Cardiff. Um, and again, this says, you know, cyclists passing um, an encouraging billboard. Mm. So there's... How does, you know, so how does that feel as an artist? You You create the work, and the importance of being able to have the impact of the work is not to put any other text on there. I mean, let's face it, it works better if there's no logo, there's no explanation, there's there's no sort of credit. So you get this incredible visibility of people seeing the work. Um, what is it like for you knowing that some people will, will know it's an artwork, some will wonder, some will know it's you, some won't, some will just appropriate it? Um, yeah, how, yeah, how I mean, do you you the artist? Yeah, well, I mean, the thing is, is I've made these kind of projects before, but actually, you know, and they and they kind of they do part of their nature is they disappear. I was I, I was doing a talk for uh, the Royal College a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me to talk about billboards, and I I, I had this immediate thought, oh, I haven't really done many billboard projects, and then I started looking through, you know, and I've actually done loads of them. It's just. <laughs> And for some reason, they don't stick in, you know, and I guess it's because at the end of the project, they disappear. Mm. But, you know, you're not, they're not, you're not carrying them around in the same way that you would a kind of physical object. It's, it's part of the nature of the thing that these things are transient. And I've always liked that. And part of the interest of working in that way is the fact that people don't know what they are, that they mm. kind of, you know, one, I, I, I didn't realize this, but I was talking to someone, a journalist, the other uh or this time last week and he was saying were you aware that at the beginning there was a rumor that they were funded by the government and they were government messaging and i i i, I you know it's probably 
one person's message on Twitter or something, but it was, you know, I hadn't, I was not aware of that, but I actually quite enjoyed the fact that that might be a thought, you know, that potentially um, it's, yeah, so on, on one level, I was absolutely fine about that and people not knowing what they were. And then actually, I think through kind of the social media stuff, they start, people started to tag them as what they were. So at least on, you know, on social platforms, they were being tagged. But, you know, as far as the press stuff, um, I mean, what actually was happening was as image banks were, were getting new images, so this, um, they would then creep out into new, you know, places. So there would be an image, a new set of images would appear on Getty Images, and then they would start yeah. to appear in Ottawa or, um, yeah, and they were being sold as well. That's what I was going to say. So this means that you you create an artwork, you distribute it. I'm I'm going to assume that there there probably wasn't a a large commission for you to do this work. No, no. I mean, you know, I I got um, they can't, you know, I, I guess as a company, Jack Hearts were in the situation that most companies were, you know, following employees and, you know, the, they gave me some money for my time designing them, but there was no kind of, you know, which they didn't have to, but there was no fee as such other than for my time. So really, you know, and the value of what they, you know, they paid for the printing and installation and all of the kind of work around it so that, you know, they, re they, they um, really, contributed a lot to making you know it wouldn't have happened without them so i have to be very thankful um for them How, no, but, you know. but, but it is important considering that we're on this this platform and a lot of people are quite interested in public art projects and and also how mm. do they come about and you know what are the mechanisms behind them and and such so it's not to call out anyone in particular i think it's also just to let people know that that very often you know, particularly during this time, even when when artists were losing losing their commissions and their work, and particularly performing artists just losing gig after gig, that there is a desire still to ask the creative set, you know, to to come out and and help and come up with a way for people to really navigate navigate the world. And so there's that value, but it it can be, you know, but acknowledging the professionalism of of the artist very often can can be a question so i guess what i'm what what i thought was so interesting when you brought this up also is that <clears throat> the image bank is going to make a considerable amount of money off of this yeah, so. <laughs> and and these are just the things yeah look at that so that's 375 pounds you know 375 pounds for being able to use the image. Now, the image, of course, is a photograph, but what makes the photograph is the artwork yeah. in relationship to the setting. So, yeah, I mean, also, you'll probably notice that a lot, I mean, it isn't, it, it varied a bit from place to place in terms of, um, you know, how stuff was credited. Um, and, you know, I think actually, it, yes, unfortunately, there is a lot of, you know, it's good for your career. Um, it's, you know, all that, kind of, oh, we've got this project, but there's no budget. All of that stuff is very familiar to anyone in, in the arts. And it's, you know, so I think the fact that I have to respect the fact um, Jack Arts were able to pay me for my time, which was, you know, it's something, you know, well, that yes. actually doesn't always happen. <laughs> yeah, at least it puts you in the professional of, you know, a designer. Or a exactly. Giving, exactly. Giving content. Do you think, yeah. I mean, do you think, do you think there's an easy way for us to to think um, because this is happening more and more often, right? People are becoming more familiar with with artists' work going out into the into the public realm, using the world, you know, as a gallery without walls. Mm. Understanding that advertising can switch over. Um, is there anything that you, that you wish would go into the process to make it more appealing or to help to help actually credit the artist? Um, mm. You well, I mean, what I sorry, sorry, Cher, I lost the end of that. I just said, uh, what could, what is it that we could change? You know, how could we, how can we make it a bit better? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I think you know, actually, some sort of base level of like, you know, you get, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, a a, ba a a sort of reasonable wage, and you know, just getting rid of this idea that you just say, look, you know, oh, sorry, there's no budget as being a default setting for working with artists even you know i've been doing what i do for a long time um 
but I res I, you know I rely on the money that I make to support myself. That's it. Well, I and, can't. and the company paid other people to go up and install it. And they paid people to program the digital work into the digital screens. So, you know, they're, it's easy enough to say this is just another component of what you need to consider when you're budgeting. You know, technicians are paid for the changing over the ads. Obviously, somebody has to do that. That that sits in a budget. So it's it's quite reasonable. I think that's framed in this case by keeping those people at work. So it kind mm -hmm. of I, I didn't see it, and I saw it more like a positive thing that they were actually trying to keep people, their employees, doing things. Oh yes, I, I don't mean it's a bad thing. I just mean that you know, for those who are looking, for those who might want to do this kind of work in the future, and they might commission artists, then it's just knowing that that needs to be a part of the budget as well. Mm. Paying the artist, yeah. is the same as paying other people who are part of making it happen. I think it's a big problem because I think it's something that it, if you you know, there's almost the sort of sense that if you don't do it for nothing. And I'm not talking about this project. It's a general problem for the arts. Is you know, it's like, well, we'll get someone else to do it. And if you don't, if they don't do it, someone will, because that is actually how things are in this industry. And they have been like that since the beginning. You know, it's 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 a sort of cultural um, problem in the arts. I mean, one thing that I did um, through this project was when I was first saw. The images being used in the media, and in some time, in some cases, being used on by media outlets that I don't necessarily have much time for. I contacted DAX, which is the sort of designer artist copyright society, who gave me some advice about, um, I guess, legal issues around copyright and um, the what they could do to help me basically. So what mm -hmm. DAX had been doing on my behalf is going um, you know, back to these media outlets and getting them to amend the credits so that at least the artwork is credited now. But you know, and they and they do that um for you know members of the society. They'll do you know they do that work on the behalf of artists. So that's a, a really worthwhile resource. Um, one thing that apparently this is an ongoing problem because one there's a kind of copyright, um, I don't know what word, copyright holiday or copyrights sort of loophole around news editorial. So, um, you know, if something's on a news story, they don't necessarily have to you know, credit the artist, or less, you know, or certainly not to kind of pay for the use of the image, um, which you know, ninety nine percent of these images were used in that way. I mean, one just to. I mean, this isn't pointing the finger at a particular individual. I mean, this is a kind of, this is um, another. No, no, this is a much broader debate, and it's just also an opportunity because we'll we'll take questions in about in about five or 10 minutes, too. And there can be. I just people, wanted to. Yeah. I mean, what I was going to say as well is that, sorry, Cherry, was that, um, you know, there was a sort of another use of these kind of images, which was, I guess, more by people who understand social media or understand, um, you know, use it as a promotion platform. So this is a kind right. of example of the sort of, you know, a singer, um, you know, and you can see the, ta you know, this is not yeah. someone walking past um, a billboard randomly. This is a photo shoot, you know, and it's being all the, you know, the clothes are tagged. It's all that kind of, in, you know, stuff that I don't really know anything about, but it's, it's the kind of, you know, inf world of the influencer. And um, you know, again, it was seeing the work used in that way. But it's part of making that sort of work. I mean, that's that's what it is. I mean, that's that that is one of the one of the trade offs, right? So one of the advantages is that you can get to an unexpected audience. A lot of people can see something. You can potentially impact their day, their viewpoint, to their ways. The trade off is that other people will also be using it. I mean, we know the world now looks like it's like one big photo shoot. You know, the number of times yeah. that I try and walk places and, and people get really upset because you're messing up their shot, you know. But again, it still it still means that it becomes an important fabric of the city. So, mm -hmm. you know, there 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 is there is a bit of that trade off. The thing that can happen sometimes is the associations that happen. 
um, you know, your name then getting tagged up with different brands and, and things like that. Have you ever had a, a situation where a brand has just sort of taken the work itself and pushed it into another realm? Um, I mean, not without my knowledge. You know, I've worked with some, you know, you know, with fashion designers before, but that's been more from a collaborative point of view. Mm. I mean, I should also add around this whole issue of use and, um, you know, monetizing use. The actual artwork is, I mean, the poster artwork I put as a free downloadable resource, so anyone can print it, you know. So, again, it wasn't ever, a, you know, which was my decision, is it just seems like the right thing to do at that point in time, um, you we know, can, in the spirit of it. We, we can do simple things, like whoever commissions you to put the work up to make sure that if they're using any promotional images, they have all your social media tags, that make sure that it goes out into announcements, to make sure if they're working with artists to put up artwork, that they do always acknowledge that it is an artwork and who the artist is. Those are things mm. that don't cost any money. But potentially, you know, those things can can be put into the to contracts or agreements very easily and quickly. And the switch of, you know, all of your social media handles and hashtags and everything can be agreed at least to, you know, to help promote that. Um, but would it have made the work any more interesting if people, you know, to me, it's actually more interesting if people don't know it's mine. You know, that's the point. I mean, part of, you know, part of it is, yes, you want to be acknowledged for the work that you've done. But actually, as of kind of an experience of an art of the the piece, it's kind of more effective when it's just this weird dissonant, you know, thing which has appeared on the street. Or yeah, yeah so for the, another couple of minutes, and then we'll we'll switch it over to some questions that are coming in. <clears throat> What's the difference then between this this work that can be quick and responsive, it can go viral, and then when you've worked on permanent pieces? Like the difference, the difference in period of time, and also what 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 are some of those uh, positives, and then also some of the challenges from doing doing permanent work as far as the process of making it happen. Yeah, I mean, obviously we've worked together on um, this this particular project at London Bridge Station. Me here now, which, you know, we was many, well, several years. In, in its sort of, um, you know, bit building to, to, to completion. Um, and I learned a lot during that process. It was extremely um, challenging, but, you know, it was also really good to sort of, you know, realize that actually I can, I can actually complete a project like that with a lot of, of assistance. Um, yeah, there were many, many partners involved there, a lot of agencies. Um, Obviously, when you're in a public space like that, that is almost 24 seven, you know, the health and safety issues, it goes on and on. Yeah, uh, exactly. And um, it's it becomes much um, more uh, a practical kind of exercise a lot of the time, you know, we, you're just, you know, it has to be constructed in a certain sort of way. Um, I mean, these things weigh, you know, tons you know and they've got thousands of bolts and you know so it's, it's it's almost like a kind of engineering um kind of feat so something is you know i tend i don't know i, I tend to sort of veer from one thing to another in terms of these these kind of works where I'm, um you know i really enjoy the permanence of these kind of pieces but actually the um you know, and then I'll suddenly feel like, yes, it's working on these things that stay up for a month to get torn down is the way forward. But actually, you know, it's a balance between these two, you know, these two things. And they're very uh, much about kind of reacting to, again, different sorts of public spaces. And, you know, I have found myself particularly, you know, in recent years working in kind of healthcare and particularly mental health settings. Mm. And you have a... a you have a piece that's just completed at the is it the Charing Cross, Annie? Yeah, so I this is like kind of let me just switch back up. Yeah, I mean, that's is that was a piece that um basically was supposed to go up um in the middle of lockdown mm. and you know, being in an A and E department, really, uh, it wasn't the wasn't possible for quite a long time. But last week, um, yeah, with with some uh, 
with a lot of help and kind of and, and generosity, we managed to. And I, when I say we, not me, but um, you know, the company Concord Graphics that I work with a lot um, managed to get the, the the work up. So this is a piece called We Work Together, which is mm -hmm. kind of throughout the A and E department at Charing Cross Hospital. So it's kind of a series of these kind of interventions around the A and E. Um, wow. And it was a, it's a it's, it, I guess it's typical of a certain way of working that I have, which is much more based on talking to people over, you know, and 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 working with um, staff there about their kind of aspirations about what an artwork could be, and the kind of messaging that they're the kind of I don't know thematic element of it coming much more from you know lo longer conversations. It's kind of it's all based on the these kind of um, images of plants that are used in modern pharmaceuticals. So it um, looks it's. <clears throat> and then one of the questions that's coming in already is about font choice and you know how how you decide on font choices in, in your work in the relationship to text. Okay, so I'm really. Um, yeah, I'm I'm probably the worst person in the world to talk about fonts because I I kind of tend tend to avoid thinking about them at all costs. But there there were, there were um I mean this particular piece. The reason I used this font was because it was originally drawn in the same year as the formation of the NHS. Oh, so wow. it, for me that was yeah. just a kind of connection. I mean, so generally I do. It is thinking a little bit about the heritage of place and the, the context in order to to realize that leads you to what kind of what kind of font you might use. Sometimes there's another meaning. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, font that I used for Please Believe that um, I mean, basically, I've used about four fonts in my whole life. Um, I I'm really not a, a type. I know nothing about fonts and type, but I and I, I just think about fonts and type in type in terms of how I imagine they sound quite a lot right. of the time. Um, one of the fonts that I use quite a lot is, um, well, I showed you that image earlier of the Labour Party, um, um, sorry, the Conservative Party uh, World Isn't Working um, billboard, which yeah. has been, uh, I, I guess, a sort of... I think it's also worth saying, Mark, for people who don't necessarily know, that you very often work with a lot of other artists. You often think about performance and um, enlivening the works. Um, and, and so one thing that you had, you had told me before and you just mentioned is this idea of also understanding what it's like when you say it aloud or, you know, if you repeat it and understanding about that live experience. And I, and I know, unfortunately, there was a performance that was scheduled um, at London Bridge wasn't there for me here now that that's yeah there. yeah um, I mean we've um yeah that was part of the collaboration with Team London Bridge and that was an interesting kind of um yeah kind of after life of that piece so we developed a kind of piece for um myself and a, a musician Daniel O'Sullivan developed well, Daniel did most of the work all of it really but um developed a piece for 10 singers so that was due to happen on the first of June, but we've, you know, like a lot of performance stuff, it's we pushed it back a year and it will happen next year. Great. But yeah, going back to type, I mean, this this is a type uh, or a font that I use a lot, and it is literally just a quote from that particular poster. So this, this, I, I, yeah, I'm very limited in fonts, and actually, when I start worrying about fonts too much, it, it normally goes kind of badly wrong. Um, I did. <laughs> work recently with uh, on a on a uh, piece in um in Luton with um, Jonathan Barnbrook who's a graphic designer and oh, yeah. typographer and Jonathan de designed the type for the piece which was a, a kind of interesting uh, way of working I've, I've not not um done before so some of the some of the questions that are coming up um overlap in you know in you know what are we what are we learning from this period of time what are we learning as a result of this pandemic? The fact that we're having to deal with distance, you know, between bodies that that touches a little bit less, that people are a little nervous about being inside. Do you think do you think this is going to open up our ideas of what what happens in public space? Do you think we'll value it more? Or are there any crazy ideas even that you've come up with um, that you think would be great to do now that possibly couldn't have been before? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's shifted a lot. I mean, I definitely feel that um, how I, I felt optimistic uh, sort of halfway through that we'd have be able to have this kind of like kind of that somehow by being distanced from the public realm that we suddenly were able to see it kind of for what it was. There was something of, of a kind of unveiling of the kind of systems that are in place. Um, you know, in a way now I've, you know, I think what's been happening um, around the, um, you know, the Black Lives Matters protests globally has introduced a, a far more complex um relationship to the public realm and that some you know I, I feel it's you know that recalibration to space and to kind of um our experience of space and you know the way that we relate to others is is so kind of deep now i you know to me i just feel like wow um you know how do i make work now how do i think about you know what agency have i got now to make this kind of work that i've been making so you know i i feel like i'm in a period of reflection that i about my practice it wasn't in maybe a month ago i said mm -hmm. i was in a different space of reflection about my practice but i you know it's it's gone somewhere new now i think it's it's a question that's coming up with a lot of people working in in public realm from design to to you know retail to building um to using it and you know the the question sometimes is how much should you design and how much should you leave in a sense feeling as if it's almost undesigned or incomplete so that it has this room to be filled with whatever is relevant to the time so like you're saying you know how do we create public spaces that engage us and make us feel um less lonely during certain periods but at the same time don't have so much presence that they mm. either contradict or um you know or come into conflict with what needs to happen in those spaces um yeah i think you know and obviously the kind of difference between a permanent work and a temporary one um you know this the, again the, the fluidity that's offered by something being temporary that it can kind of um, but then you know something which is permanent can have a, a effect over a long period of time over a way that you know people experience this. I guess it a lot of it comes down to just the quality of the artwork, um, which at the point of something going in is not always clear. You can't always tell. Um, you know there have been examples of public artworks which have had ter terrible reception at the you know the point at which they're in you know unveiled, and then the community that live in that area would take it on and you know it becomes emblematic of, of their and their aspirations um and there's been other works that have sort of you know and, and i'm talking about contemporary art, art here rather than you know, historical um monuments but you know that haven't functioned so well yeah i guess that's a, a good way to think about it where we where we had had monuments before where we're questioning the role of of monuments then when we think about permanence now, I guess, you know, we we really need to think about what is that kind of, what is that permanent gesture that one wants to make in that space? And like you say, you know, much like how your practice, you can become very interested in the permanent and other times it feels right to do something that is of the moment and temporary. You know, our world needs that balance as well. And so sometimes it's knowing that, you know, choosing permanent means you're trying to make a commitment or a statement or a long-term sort of security and the temporary allows you to be far more fluid with what's what's happening at the moment and perhaps getting that balance is is one of the things that we need to we need to look for yeah um, and also you know permanence doesn't equal kind of hubris does it i mean i think you can still make mm -hmm. permanent works which are you know humble and open Yes, they don't have to be a declaration of ego. <laughs> no, but you know, it's the art world. <laughs> Not just art, I guess. One of the things that someone has asked about is um, the work challenges, wait, work challenges people in the everyday and embraced by social media. There we go. And so this means it'll be used by brands and other companies. Are there any ideas about safeguarding one's, one's work in this way? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. I mean, I definitely feel like, you know, is that something I've experienced through this artwork? And um, from 
my point of view, you know, I think the best thing you can do, you know, and especially, I guess I'm talking about artists in the UK, is to get in contact with DAX, which is mm -hmm. the um, designer, design and arts copyright society, an artist copyright society, and you know, get some advice there. Um, I think, unfortunately, there are lots and lots of loopholes about usage, particularly in news. I think with brands, it's probably more, you know, this sort of insidious kind of use that one has to watch out for, um, you know, where it's the tagging of artworks or the other option is just make something which is so kind of, you know, repellent that they would never go anywhere near it. <laughs> There's always somebody who wants, you know, somebody else's repellent is somebody else's beauty, isn't mm. it? I guess one of the yeah. things is just knowing when realistically you can control it when you can't and what you do, you know, what you can do to safeguard it when you can. Um, and then also, I think as a community, it's important to help. So um, I know as soon as we had had a, a first conversation that somebody had sent out a newsletter using your image, um, to promote something and it hadn't actually credited. So I, as a person can write to that person and say, hi, <laughs> you missed the credit on this artist's work. Yeah, um, I think that's important because it actually is a lot of the time, you know, artists and people in the arts community who will know what something is and they'll understand the, ca I mean, it's sort of casual misuse. It's quite often done by people who are working in the same sector as well. Yeah. So um, someone's got a question about um, the Black Lives Matter movement in response to the statues. Here we go. Should be the temporality of artworks. And what do we think is an upper limit? So this is a great question. You know, what is a permanent artwork now? And this might be sculptural um, or it might even, of course, the question comes up very often with what's a permanent digital work. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we should be defining or do you think we should assume that permanent means we assume it's there and until it, it no, until it, it's, it gives a different message or serves a different purpose than its original intention or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because you know, you know, and I know that in, in, in terms of permanent, you know, we're normally talking about it, what that means in a contract with mm -hmm. a, you know, client, you know, someone who's commissioning an artwork and, you know, it can, it can be quite fundamental actually in terms of the kind of work you're making, because if, the, you know, if the, just if, the desire is for a permanent artwork which lasts 10 years, that's very different from a permanent artwork which lasts 25 years, just in terms of the material that you're able, you know, that you can work with and the kind of budgetary mm. constraints of working with certain materials. I mean, I don't, I, I, I don't, there's definitely, I, and also think about upkeep as well. The way that works are sustained and cared for is a massive part of um, commissioning permanent works. Um, it is. And since it's required of the artist to put, you know, the maintenance together, it's also a great opportunity for the artist to be able to say what needs to be done in order for, for it to be mm. kept up. Well, our, our friend, our friend Mark Davy is asking, you know, based on based on your last London Bridge experience, does this um, does this still, does this make you want to work in more permanent structures or being embedded in architecture? Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, I'm all, you know, always interested in those kind of projects, especially with the ones where actually there's a real, I mean, that piece of work, uh, I made something which I had never made anything close to before for that in terms of the scale and the kind of technicality of it. Yes, there are lots of challenges in it, but those kind of commissions working with buildings and spaces and architects and engineers, you know, Otherwise, I'm kind of limited to working on posters because that's kind of the level of my technical, uh, you know, pasting up a poster or you know, pinning a poster to a wall. But um, well, we don't we don't want to limit you to uh, to any one medium. It's it's more exciting to watch you cross between them. I think we've come to time. I'm now even sort of running over. So um, I want to thank you so much, Mark, for for taking time to be able thank to you. have a conversation, sort of. Also to, to give a little bit of transparency to you know what happens for all of us working in this area. And, um, and also to note that yes, Jack Arts has been, and someone mentioned this too, has been very good consistently with working with creatives and, and treating them mm. professionally. So please know we were just trying to open up the, the broader question. Um, thanks to the Arts in Place Consortium, London Collective, who helped introduce me to you guys. 
there's still four more conversations that are coming over the, the next few weeks. So it's up on the slide here. Please check the website and also to continue the conversation on Twitter and uh, keep in touch with us. And please, please make sure that you start following uh, Mark Titchener and crediting him wherever you can. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you.